Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ, a jam-packed edition, as always, of our uh, illustrious show. Of course, just so many topics, a lot of stories. The fact that we're on a Friday, it actually worked out for us because of the fact that we are able to pretty much not miss anything. That being said, of all the topics I wrote down, whether it's the Oilers, the Canadians, the Coyotes, the Canucks, some of the teams mentioned today, they might pale in comparison to the biggest sports story of Thursday, which was James Harden getting traded to the Philadelphia 76ers for Ben Simmons and a whole bunch of other picks. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the particulars of that trade, but everyone was talking about the NBA trade deadline and the ensuing NBA all-star draft uh, where James Harden ended up being the last pick and LeBron was laughing his ass off at everything. And the people in the NHL world were like, well, why can't the NHL be like this? Why can't the NHL be like the NBA, CJ? Well, I'd love to tell you March 21st is going to bring similar fireworks in the NHL because – you know, obviously at TSN, we're going to be on studio all day. I'm sure, our counterparts at Sports Center have similar plans. But, you know, I think there's a few factors. I mean, for one, and one individual basketball player makes a bigger difference, I think, on a team. And so, in, in some senses, like if you are really going all in, like I think that there's a little bit more motivation, even. Like, as good as, say, Claude Giroux is, and, and he's still very good. If you look at it, he's, he's not far below a point a game this year. Like the, the team looking to acquire him would still be nervous about whether he's going to fit in, like whether it's enough time because he's a rental player. Is it worth giving up the assets? I think I think basketball players can make more immediate and sizable impacts just with the way rosters work. And then, of course, a salary cap. I mean, that's the boring answer. It's just a true answer that the NHL salary cap hasn't increased for three seasons now, may not increase next year. And even if it does, it's by one million. Um, and so everyone just doesn't have enough money to move around. I mean, uh, half the leagues at LTIR right now, and, and there'll still be trades at the deadline, but I think it it prevents teams from doing what they want to do. Like, let's take the Avalanche again, just because just it's fun. I mean, I think in a perfect world, they would be willing to trade for Claude Giroux and for Marc-Andre Fleury to kind of push their chips in at this deadline. But I'm not sure that there's any way that they can make that work cap-wise um, because Giroux is a little over $8 million, Fleury is a $7 million goaltender, even if he retain salary and all the, the sort of tricks that, that teams try to pull. I just don't know if you can pull that off. And so if we had some sort of luxury tax system a way for, you know, especially contending teams or bigger market teams to, you know, spend past the cap, but, 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 you know, have to do so and pay a penalty. I mean, that's probably the solution that would spur more trade interest and see things like this happen. But, you know, under Gary Batman, that's just not going to happen. I think that he likes the hard salary cap. It's, it brings some sort of, I guess, peace for owners that they know that they're never going to spend more than, than half of what's, brought in and and so we're stuck with what we have although let's face it there is there's a lot of trades on trade deadline usually they're just not as many blockbusters and this year there are more big names in play than normal so maybe maybe we'll get a surprise come march that is a very good tease for march 21st uh, for trade deadline coverage i can't wait to when we cross that bridge how we'll do an episode around that i i we'll, we'll figure that all out in due time um but uh we'll get to trades in due time but we have to deal with coaches today. It seems like a lot of coaches, uh, a lot of talk about coaches today. The Edmonton Oilers uh, made a coaching change. Dave Tippett on the way out. Jay Woodcroft taking his place. I'm really curious about the decision being done now and not in the midst of that long losing streak that they were in. What were your impressions of, of uh, the firing for Dave Tippett and, and Jay Woodcroft coming in for the Oilers? Well, it's pretty telling that Ken Holland went 25 years almost as an NHL GM before doing this, before firing a coach in season. Um, you know, obviously the, those teams he was a GM of in Detroit, most of them weren't having seasons, maybe a coach for Mike get fired. But, but, you know, if you look back, there were times he could have done it. But, you know, he was always one who believed in stability kind of in times of crisis, um, you know, didn't want to do the, you know, like there's sort of this ethos, right? Like you can't fire all the players, so you fire the coach. And we've had seven NHL head coaches fired already this season, which to me seems like quite a number. I mean, the turnover has been significant around the league this year. And so I think looking at the GM's history instructs us on just how desperate the situation is in Edmonton, because 
you, you know, he didn't want to do this. You know, he said at his press conference three months ago, I was hoping we'd be talking about a Dave Tippett extension because Dave Tippett was in the last year of his deal. And so, you know, unlike some GMs where it might be a self-preservation move to, to fire a coach or they might be a little quicker, you know, I don't think there's any of that at play. I think Ken Owens worried about the Oilers missing the playoffs um, because they've, they've been on a pretty extended losing run since early December. I know they, you know, did rack up some wins before the all-star break, but then they come out of the all-star break and lose two in a row in kind of lackluster fashion. And so this, this, uh, you know, this, this, this Edmonton situation is fascinating because, you know, throughout the course of a year, there's always going to be teams that get off course or have seasons that they deem to be disappointing. They make moves like this, but like Edmonton isn't just any other team, right? Like Edmonton is two of the best players on earth, you know, among their forward group. They, they, they had three number one picks in a row before that. I mean, this is a franchise for a long time has been trying to get it right. Um, you know, they've had more successful regular seasons in the past, but still haven't had much to show for it. And, and it just feels like it's perilously close to, you know, kind of going off the rails. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of money now committed to a lot of players on that team. We, we talked about the cap, you know, Edmonton doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver even at this deadline, but even beyond it, um, you know, they, they signed Darnell Nurse and Zach Hyman to big deals, obviously dry and McDavid are already on long-term contracts. Um, you know, they're, they're going to have some younger defensemen in particular and, and Phil Broberg's already been brought up. So he's going to get a, a look probably here in the near future, but you know, they've got some defensemen coming in their pipeline, but it's not just not, it's not clear to me if this group isn't good enough as constructed, like how, how much tinkering more can be done to it. And so this is, this is a kind of fascinating time. Um, you know, Jay Woodcroft's a very respected coach. He's, he sort of followed the path you'd expect someone to become an NHL coach just being an assistant so long uh, and having a lot of success now, most recently down in the AHL was 10 years in NHL assistant before that. So, you know, I think he's being thrown into a bit of a tough situation, although you, you might as well look at the glass half full. I mean, sometimes when you're getting hired for your first coaching gig, there's no players. He's got some pretty, uh, pretty shiny toys in this lineup, but, you know, it hasn't worked so far this year. Uh, did you hear that quote from Ken Holland about how it's been up and down? The season has been up and down like a toilet seat. Is he right when he says that? Well, he is because it was they were 16 and five out of the gate. I mean, they had an outrageously – uh, hot power play to start the year. Um, you know, McDavid and, and Drysaddle were both over two points per game for like 20 odd games there. They couldn't keep that up. I don't think anyone should realistically think they're going to keep that up. You know, it's, it's not complete video game numbers from like the Gretzky era uh, that, that today's players can have. And so, you know, they're both still having very productive seasons, um, but it's been a lot of down lately. I mean, I guess it hasn't been up and down. It was up, then it's been down. I don't know, but it hasn't, hasn't really, it's not like a stock that's going ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Um, you know, it was really, you know, pronounced up and then it's been pretty pronounced down through December and January and, and now in early February. Um, you know, but all is not lost. Like they, they, you know, they still have 38 games that the math is becoming a little less on their side, but there's, there's a playoff spot for them there. If they get playing well, it's just, they've, they've played so poorly for so long. You just wonder, can they pull themselves out of this? You know, can they get goaltending? I know we, we hit on this so much, but I mean, when you're 28th in the league in, in save percentage, you're just probably not going to make the playoffs. Like they're just going to need better than 900, you know, team goaltending to, to make the playoffs. Um, I'm not sure there's a trade coming there, to be honest. So, you know, that that's a question mark to me. It, it probably sunk Dave Tippett to a degree. And, you know, it's a challenge now for, for Jay Woodcroft. You know, it's, it's notable too. They brought up Dave Manson, his assistant coach from Bakersfield, you know, who coached their defensemen. I mean, clearly there's going to be an issue. There's going to be a focus rather on the defensive side of the puck and maybe playing a little better in front of those goaltenders uh, in order to have some success. But, um, you know, this, this just reeks of a bit of an emergency like situation around that team. doesn't mean it's going to go badly, but you know, this, this is a pretty interesting time to watch the Oilers. I'd say. Well, one, one, one interesting note in your last answer, you're right. We have been banging the drum for, goaltending for for the Edmonton Oilers and I think I thought at one point you felt pretty confident that they were going to make a move and, and now I, I get the sense from you now that it doesn't look as if it's on the horizon like what's changed I think the way they view their situation like they're only going to have so much money to put into play in terms of acquiring players at the deadline and it, it sounds like they're maybe more interested in, in getting a defenseman than a goaltender right now it's not that they don't have interest in a goaltender I think maybe the fact that they don't feel that there's 
an obvious upgrade out there that they can easily get that, that, you know, could, could sort of stop the bleeding maybe um, plays into that somewhat. I mean, certainly this summer, that will be a big focus at Edmonton, uh, no matter what happens at, at the deadline. I think that, you know, they're going to be a team in free agency looking to fill at least one spot, uh, if not both uh, through, through, uh, you know, through free agency with the goaltender. But, you know, it sounds to me like they're maybe more inclined to, to go out and try to get a D to stabilize things uh, than a goalie, but who knows? I mean, we, we're still weeks away from the deadline and, you know, I think that there's still time for that to switch, but, you know, basically they didn't find anything that they were looking for that was available at this point. I think they're maybe put, putting some efforts elsewhere, but it doesn't mean they can't circle back and change course again. That is very true. And uh, of course, when, uh, we, when it comes time for us to talk about more trades, we'll bring back the uh, the trading pile. Remember that trading pile segment we had like last week, had all those players. We'll, we'll find a way to bring that back. Uh, last thing about the Oilers, just so they need, they get a new coach. They're how many points out of the playoffs I wonder what Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl must be feeling just about their season. The fact that at one point in the year, we're looking at them as like a two horse race for the MVP trophy. And now they're within, I guess, a couple months of, of them just falling short of the playoffs. Like, I'm just curious. I, I would love to know how they feel about everything that's gone on this year for them. Well, it's complete frustration. I mean, you can see it. I think particularly in Draisaitl, if you watch the games, um, you know, and, and, I think frustration, it's not necessarily a productive emotion, but I think it's completely understandable here. Um, You know, I I don't think there's anything to suggest those guys don't want to win. In fact, you know, I was in an interview in Vegas, you know, Connor McDavid was speaking on media day and someone was asking him about the close scoring rate. And he was sounded like exasperated. He was like, guys, (laughs) I'm telling you, I do not care if I win the scoring race. All I want to do is win at Edmonton. Like, you know, he's won what I think he's won three scoring titles he could win it every year for the next five years if it was a priority or if it was his focus, you know, he wants to win the big shiny silver thing. Man. And I, all players get there. Right. I mean, I think players earlier in the career, something you don't want to win a cup early in your career, but you're still proving yourself in the league. And, and, you know, you, you want to, you know, whether it's like Austin Matthews finally won the rocket Richard last year after being a great closer. But I think eventually if you asked Austin, like the fact that at least keep losing in the first round, probably pisses him off more. Like he doesn't care about the individual stuff. I mean, I, I just think that's the way it goes. And so those guys have to be frustrated. They're, they're mid career now. Um, I mean, they might play, they haven't got to 10 years. They might play 10 years beyond this point, but they're, they're in the prime of it. And it's slipping through their fingers in terms of another season where the team looks like it's in a position to do anything of note. And man, I mean, I, I don't know the way out. Like I'm, I'm certainly not one saying these guys are getting traded this, you know, if this doesn't work, they get traded this summer. I don't, I think you're, you're, you're rolling it back. I just think you're really running out of different ways to improve the team around them and seasons where they're going to be this, this great. Um, you know, look, Patrice Bergeron still having a great year. So like, you know, I'm not saying these guys are going to not be great for a long time, but it just, it, it feels urgent and it feels like the Oilers as an organization don't have a lot of other solutions. If, what they've been doing doesn't work because, you know, Ken Holland's now a little closer to the door. You know, he's made this one coaching change. He only has so many moves he can pull. Um, I don't think they can start again at this stage. And so, man, it's look, this sports at its best is reality TV. I think the Oilers are reality TV. Honestly, I think that this is, it's, it's a fascinating experiment. You know, it's difficult for those players and we're all watching them, man. We're all wondering what's going to happen. And, and, if they can find something, if you know, maybe a new voice behind the bench does help. And that's, I saw Bruce Boudreau had a little, had a little bit of kick there in Vancouver, although Thatcher Demko getting hot, you know, didn't hurt his chances with that. And so, you know, a lot of times it is goaltending. I, I don't think that Dave Tippett got good enough goaltending to expect to keep his job. And, and unfortunately that's part of the position. Well, it's funny to, you know, think that what is, what would the Oilers core have to do, uh, or at least manager would have to do with the core in place I think about it from the player side. If you're Connor McDavid and you're going through year after year after year of just falling short, even though you have that big contract, how long until you say enough is enough? I want to go somewhere where I can for sure win. I'd be, I, I don't see him doing that. Like, I know that thought is out there. Like that you're not, you're not crazy for suggesting it. Like, I think that there's a lot of people that think that's going to happen, but 
you know, I look at him as like an extreme high achiever in his life, obviously to be this good at any one thing and, and something as competitive as hockey is. And, you know, he's a proud guy. He signed that contract. He wears a captain C, you know, I'm sure that there must be days like anyone where he's like, Oh, I wish I was playing with this guy and this guy and this guy, you know, like, like I think it's natural to have that feeling, but I, I don't think he's going to go demand a trade. I mean, anything could happen. Wayne Gretzky was traded, right? That is very organization once upon a time. Um, You know, I'm not saying he'll never be traded, but I, I I don't see him demanding his way out. Honestly, I think he's going to continue to look for solutions uh, himself. And, you know, there's every chance this works too. Like that's, that's the funny thing. Like when we talk about some of these teams, you know, we don't, we don't get to see the ending yet. Like the season is only a little bit more than half over for Edmonton. They played 44 games as a recording this so there's still a world where this move is a stroke of genius they get hot and then where all this sort of gets laid to, to rest you know had we been doing you know the pod a few years ago we'd be talking about the st louis blues you know in 2018-19 like what a disaster they're gonna have to trade all these guys and then you know they end up lifting the stanley cup and that's the extreme end of it i'm not forecasting a cup in edmonton as you know i i, I didn't even put them in the contender pile earlier in the season to much Oilers fans mad at you but um, you know, I still, I, you know, I think it looks probably worse today than it's going to look like I, I, I see them getting in the mix for the playoffs and having a better second half and having this move work out. But, you know, that's why we got to watch the games. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. That is very true. That is exactly why we have to watch the games. Speaking of games. To, oh, well, that's a great segue to my next topic because I've watched a lot of those games. And, uh, well, it's not too good over at Montreal. But uh, Dominic Ducharme, uh, once an interim head coach for the Canadians, ended up being full-time to start off this year. It is It had not gone well for him. A 7-1 loss against the New Jersey Devils was it. He's out, and Martin St. Louis is in. Before we talk about uh, St. Louis' credentials or lack thereof and, and his head coaching debut on Thursday night, uh, look. When you heard Marte St. Louis was joining the organization, what was your first thought? Well, I actually got wind of it before it was announced, and I heard he was joining the organization. It didn't occur to me when I first heard that rumor or that piece of info that it would be as the head coach. Um, you know, and that's not a shot of Martin St. Louis, and I'm sure we'll get into this. I don't even mind the hiring. Like, I don't mind trying something different. I, I think it's still a steep learning curve even for someone who played as many games as he did, who's as smart as he is, um, you know, Martin St. Louis was always known as a player. Like when you interviewed him, like he, he really had thoughtful answers, had a little edge to him. And I mean that in the best way possible. I think anyone who's five foot six and makes the NHL and wins a hard trophy. And it's, I think he won a scoring title too. You know, like I think so, yeah. anyone, who, anyone who has that, you know, was on waivers early in his career and then won a hard trophy. I mean, like, obviously there's a lot of heart in him, a lot of grind and grit. Um, so anyway, he, he was, to me, I'm not surprised to hear he would become an NHL head coach. It's just that to have never been on the bench, even as an assistant to, you know, hasn't worked for an NHL team. I know he worked for Columbus a little bit, um, doing some specialty coaching work with John Torella a couple seasons ago, but you know, this it's, it's a big jump, but I think it's kind of cool. I think it's interesting. Uh, it's probably going to be, you know, a bit of a strange dynamic, you know, Luke Richardson, for example, is on his staff right now. You know, he coached the Canadians as a head coach in a Stanley cup final game when Dominic Ducharme was in COVID protocol last year. And so, you know, the fact, and he's very, very experienced, you know, as an assistant coach uh, in prior stops. And so, you know, there'll, there'll be some of that to work through, but yeah, I was, I was surprised that he was the guy, but I'm, I'm all here for the social experiment. And I, and I do think let's look at the season as it is like they've, they said Martin San Luis has got a contract for the rest of the season. I mean, the Canadians are more than halfway through the season with eight wins. You know, Jacob Markstrom has as many shutouts as the Canadians have wins this year. And so if you're going to, if there's ever a season, maybe to try something a little different and, and with, you know, with little consequence, I, I think this is it because it's pretty clear winning games is not a huge organizational priority at the moment. I think they want to see what how Martin Stanley can grow in the job, what kind of response he gets from the players and all that, and evaluate if he'll be here beyond this. But you know, the Montreal bench has been like the most dangerous place to be in the, since like the bubble, right? I mean, you go yeah. back then, you had, you know, unfortunately, Claude Julian had a heart issue in the bubble. 
So Kirk Muller took over on interim basis there. You know, then you get into last season, Claude Julian's fire, Dominic Ducharme takes over on interim basis. Then he gets COVID, Luke Richardson, like four guys coached the team in 12 months. Now you got Martin San Luis there and, and he's only promised a couple months. Like you, it's, it's been a pretty big turnstile. I don't know the way that's all shaken out. And, you know, I think San Luis in pole position to, to keep the job beyond the season. It's certainly not his intent to have it be short term. I think the organization hopes this works out, but it's a little bit of a, a calculated gamble. And for that reason, I like it given this isn't a team trying to win a Stanley cup right now. Uh, to add to the turnstile uh, analogy, uh, when Dominic Ducharme was hired as interim head coach for the Canadians, uh, Alex Burroughs, who was an assistant for the AHL affiliate, also came up with him. And also partway through last year, Stefan Waite, the goaltending coach, was basically fired in the middle of a game. And Sean Burke eventually took over as uh, the director of, of goaltending for the team. So it's not just head coach. There's like a lot of turnover. Trevor Latowski is a new assistant on the staff as well. You're right. There has been so much turnover behind the bench for the Montreal Canadiens over the last how many months? It's, it's a bit wild. You know what the takeaway is? There's a lot of people getting paid not to work by Montreal right now. Mm-hmm. 1.7 mil. Right? Like we're in a pandemic yep. as much as I'm kind of being a bit of a goof. Um, but, you know, these contracts – are fully guaranteed when, when, when coaches sign them. So uh, at least for the most part. And so that that's money that, you know, an owner is paying at a time when he can't sell tickets to his games or, or not as many tickets as he'd like. Um, so that there's real consequences to that. You know, he went, his team finally goes on a cup a run to the cup last year and he couldn't sell as many tickets as he liked during that run. So, I mean, it's just, it's a challenging time, but it's not the ideal time to be going through that, that amount of turnover and, you know, you've made changes in the management ranks now, too. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the Canadians are just getting started here, uh, you know, I think with with overhauling the organization. Absolutely. Uh, for context, I think the Canadians right now are paying Claude Julien, Dominic Ducharme, and Martin St. Louis. So that's at least $7 million between all three that's of those guys. That, yeah. 6.7. Julian was five. Yes. Uh, 1.7, give or take, to Dominic Ducharme. So 6.7 before, I don't know what Martin St. Louis is getting paid, but it, pretty confident it's more than 300000 So, yeah, north of $7 million. Yeah, it's a bit much. I'll, I'll, I'll get to Martin St. Louis here. I'm with you on the fact that the hiring itself, I, I, I don't mind it. I think it's actually, uh, considering the circumstances, it can't hurt to have an offensive-minded player try to coach up this team as they try to become more offensive minded. I can understand there are people who look at his lack of credentials and will make the point that why is a player like him able to get an opportunity when there are other guys out there who, who have maybe more decorated coaching resumes, but I, I, I don't think this is that big of an issue. It's not as if Martin St. Louis is going to coach this team up to the playoffs. Funny enough, I think, uh, like, I was listening to a live room uh, that uh, Marc Antoine Gaudet and, and Arpin Basu were having on the Athletic, and one guy chimed in. They were taking questions from subscribers, and one guy comes in and he starts talking about Martin Saint Louis, and he's like genuinely worried that like his intro presser made him seem so competent and so good because it was really good to the point that like, what if what if it stops all the tanking efforts for this team? Like, I don't think the Canadians are so. Like the Canadians are pretty far deep in the basement that there's, I don't think there's any way MSL could do that, but that's how impressive Mark, Martin St. Louis, a guy who had never coached the NHL was to the media for the first time. Like he, he, he seemed competent. He seemed to want to just build up skill players, offensive players. Like it's really fascinating to see how people have gone from, uh, I don't know if he's the guy to do it to like, wow, is, could this guy really just be an interim head coach? That's a take though, that you're worried that he's going to be too good. I mean, come on. Um, yeah, I think that's that, not my take. That's, that's, that's no, one know. guy. Exactly. That's yeah. That's really wild. I was like, really? I like, like come that. on. It's one thing to give a strong press conference. It's another to actually coach a team. that's only won eight games out of 40, whatever, to somehow like magically turn that into a team. That's going to be like ripping through the league. It's just not going to happen. Not with the injuries, not with all the circumstances going on around the Canadians. Um, you know, Martin St. Lee, I think you'll measure his success and like, what can he get out of someone like Cole Caulfield? Right. I mean, that's an obvious comparable but I, I think you're looking at what he can you know get out of certain individuals you know see see some maybe improvements in team play but we're not measuring how good the job he does by wins and losses I, I just don't think that's realistic reasonable and you know I 
deep down, I don't think it's not like the organization is trying to lose games, but at this point, they're not, there's not a heavy incentive to win games. Um, so you, know, you might as well have the best lottery odds when you're hosting the draft in July. I mean, that's going to happen. We'll see what happens with the restrictions, but um, you know, pretty obvious where, where Montreal's headed for the rest of the season. I think you'll see some players shipped out at the deadline. You know, it's going to be hard to win games. I think you're looking for some specific responses and specific growth with, with you know, individuals that, that are important to the team's long-term future. Not sure if you saw earlier this week as well with the Canadians, uh, the Bell Centre will be at 50% capacity February 21st, and by March 14th, they hope to be at full capacity. So there's already some loosening there. By the way, February 21st, the Canadians play the Toronto Maple Leafs at the Bell Centre. Yeah. I feel much oh, I, <laughs> I figured. Um, there's one other note with the Canadians I want to mention as well. Uh, I, I thought it was just maybe like a reach at first, but I, I have questions about this. So uh, Martin St. Louis joins the organization. A lot of people eventually start asking about uh, another guy who was rumored to join the organization after him, Vincent Le Cavalier, uh, once upon a time a, a teammate of Martin St. Louis in Tampa Bay. Uh, like Cavalier straight up went to French outlets and was saying like, no, it's not true. I'm not joining the Montreal Canadiens, but I feel as if there's like smoke still around this or, or, or are we able to put this to bed? There's no way he's joining the Canadians. Oh, I think he might join them. It's just, it's what does the role look like? What does the, you know, how much of a commitment is it um, from his time perspective? You know, remember not only was he a teammate of Martin St. Louis, he was a client of Ken Hughes. Yeah, is, he was. Uh, his brother, you know, works for the same agency that Hughes used to work for. So, you know, there's, there's deep connections at multiple levels. Um, you know, there was a time, there was some pretty heavy rumors way back when Julian, that Vincent LeCavier was going to be traded to Montreal. Too, I remember. I, there was more than a little smoke to those rumors too. That there was never materialized, but it was there. So, I mean, the, I, I, the connections there, I think what it comes down to is LeCavier is still living, you know, in the Tampa area with his family. You know, he had a very successful career. On the ice and off the ice, made a lot of money, living a good life down there. You know, I don't get the sense that he wants to jump into anything full time, relocate to Montreal, you know, be, you know, because I think the rumor was he was going to be assistant general manager. And that's just not true. Um, but, you know, I could see some sort of advisory role, you know, similar to what Scott Niedebeyer took this week in Anaheim. Um, you know, I, 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 could, I could see him being part of the front office in some capacity. But I, I just don't expect it to be too involved or, or too significant of a title. Hey, does this sound familiar? You got one device that lets you catch the game live, another one that lets you stream your favorite shows, and you're watching sports highlights on your phone. I, I know I like to do that. And, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. I want to tell you about a simple way that gets you all the entertainment that you love without the hassle, and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. No more juggling remotes. You don't need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. Get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package, but just go to directtv.com. We're still in the middle of winter. Football and basketball and hockey very much in full swing. And for many of us, there's no better way to enjoy the games than by having some skin in the game. That is why BetMGM remains the exclusive betting partner of The Athletic. And as a fan of The Athletic, you can bet $10 to win $150 plus a free three-month subscription or extension of your subscription to The Athletic when you bet with BetMGM using our promo code. Sign up at BetMGM.com and use the promo code THEATHLETICPOD at checkout to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sports books. That's bet $10 to win $150 plus three months free from the athletic at betmgm.com. And you have to use the promo code, the athletic pod at checkout, the athletic pod, all in one word, new customer offer, visit betmgm.com 
for terms and conditions. Okay. Um, so that's it for the Montreal Canadiens here. That's through through the coaching portion of uh, the Chris Johnston show on a Friday. Uh, I want to talk about the Arizona Coyotes, a team we've mentioned before, more for their off-ice stuff than their on-ice stuff. Uh, they announced on Thursday that they had reached a multi-year agreement with Arizona State University to play games at their multi-purpose arena. Uh, I believe the deal is through 2025, but they have an option for 2026. I still can't believe this is happening. Uh, we don't have to get into the Austin Matthews talk like we did the last time we mentioned them. But uh, the fact that the Coyotes are actually going to try to go through with this is uh, still pretty newsworthy. It is. And, and look, this is all about their the other arena in Tempe they want to build. Um, and so, you know, Gary Batman was pretty clear at All-Star Weekend. Like, if that arena project doesn't go through, then, you know, there might be a discussion here about what the future of the team looks like. This is, a, this is a short-term solution while they get that arena built, but they haven't got approval to get that arena built yet. And so that's, you know, this is, this is sort of this allows us to say, okay, next season the Coyotes are going to play at Arizona State University. But, you know, there's still sort of this sideline story that will go on about, you know, whether they're able to get the necessary approvals, you know, break ground, start building this huge arena complex they want to build. And, and you know, the NHL, and I think quite rightly believes if they get that done, and it's, it's still an if, you know, the, the, the whole fortunes of this organization will look different. You know, Tempe is close to downtown Phoenix, close to the airport, um, you know, much more convenient for fans to get in and out of than where they play in Glendale right now, which, you know, if you've ever taken an Uber there, you, you better, uh, you better have lots of credit on your card. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a trip. You know, this is, this is geographically a better place for them to be, you know, the plans that they have in place are spectacular for what they want this to whole district to look like. So this is the short-term pain and there's pain here. Like the Coyotes are having to put 19.7 million into facilities, basically to build NHL dressing rooms and, and, you know, weight facilities and the like kind of in a bubble off the side of where the arena is like those stay behind. The Coyotes don't get replaced by that. You know, there's, there's costs associated with, you know, upgrading it so that an NHL style broadcast can be done from, from a technical standpoint in that arena. You know, the, the, the university gets that they can't sell naming rights on the building. Uh, which is, you know, a pretty common place that the teams generate revenue. You know, there's only the 5,000 seats. I believe there's 16 suites or boxes, you know, in both cases, that's well below what you'd see in any other NHL rank. And so there's a financial cost to this. The Coyotes are hoping it's sort of the, the short-term pain for long-term gain. And, and, you know, they actually do hope, and I, I don't think this is crazy, that they might be able to, in this window, create kind of a unique atmosphere around their games. I mean, Going to see an NHL game in that small of a venue, like I, I'm excited to actually do it. I, you know, I'm curious about how it'll look and feel. Um, I, I could see it being, you know, especially if the team gets better, which you know at this point, I don't even know who's going to play for them next year. Like their their cap friendly page is hilarious. It's it's like <laughs> a block of UFA for next season. I mean, they, they, to say they have a blank canvas is an understatement for what they can do with their team next year. Um, but obviously, they've, they've amassed a huge number of draft picks. At some point, they're going to start building up. I mean, I, I, I could see, I can see where it, there is, there is some hope here, but there's still a lot that has to get done and nothing more important than getting the, the big rink, um, you know, the approvals there and actually getting that thing built. Cause if not, I guess what I'm saying here is unless that happens, we're still going to be wondering to some degree, about the future of this team. You're not kidding when you say like the, for next year, like there's just blocks of UFAs. Like Phil Castle, Louis Erickson, Antoine Roussel, Ryan Dezingle, Light Liam O'Brien, Riley Nash, Alex Galchenia, Travis, like all those are forwards. Those are all UFAs. Also, the Coyotes have seven uh, draft picks within the first two rounds of this year's upcoming NHL draft. Like this is this could there's a lot. Obviously, a major reconstruction. We don't need to go into all that. But uh, yeah, you're right. The Coyotes could put their draft table on the stage. They could speed it up if their draft table was <laughs> on the stage because they're going to be picking so frequently. Exactly. Uh, I, I, I still think it's a little weird for them to be playing in a venue like that. But if they make the experience and the atmosphere cool, like maybe it could work. But like it, they're definitely going to have the most unique situation in the league. Yeah, th that we've ever seen. Like I, I don't see you'd have to go way back to find anything equivalent to this. I'm sure it happened at some point. But in my, you know, 20 years basically covering the NHL, I've never seen anything like this. I've been to all the buildings games have been played in. Uh, multiple times, you know, the closest might be Nassau Coliseum. 
I don't know what the capacity was there, but it was a smaller building. It had an intimate feel. It was actually a great place to go watch a game for that reason. I understand why the Islanders went and built their new arena because, you know, there wasn't enough ways to capitalize on it. And it was kind of a dusty old barn, but that was part of the charm too, I would say. And, you know, the crowd in there was loud. Um, that's why I think I actually believe Arizona could create something like that. I mean, even being on a university campus, maybe get the, the crowd to skew a bit younger. Like there, no, you know, the people, the coyotes aren't trying to put this forward as like the perfect solution. I think this is, this is clearly a solution born out of the circumstances. I think they're trying to, to find some of the hope in it or find some of the, the, the benefits that might come with this. And, and it's, it's not going to be all bad, but financially, I don't think it makes a ton of sense. Um, but it does make sense if you're getting that big rank, like if, if they get to build a, a proper arena, a proper arena district in a right part of their city, we'll finally know once and for all if, if the organization can make it work. I mean, you know, hockey's big in Arizona, man. Like it's like Austin Matthews is the most easy and notable one to point to, but there's a number of players at the U S national program from Arizona, you know, played world juniors are getting drafted. Like they, there's actually a bit of a foothold there for hockey. It's the fifth largest city, I believe in the U S I mean, it's not crazy for the NHL to want to make it work there. I think for like a lot of reasons, it's just, there's been so many significant hurdles and this, this is maybe the biggest of them all in some ways um, that a lot of people wonder why they keep bothering, but I I actually, I get it um, because, you know, one of the best players in the game literally wouldn't be playing hockey if the coyotes didn't exist. I mean, Austin's family didn't have any ties to hockey whatsoever. He went to a game and wanted to play. And so maybe he's in the major leagues right now or something uh, because obviously he's got some pretty uh, special athletic talent, you know, if, if, if the Coyotes aren't there. And I think if, as a sport, you know, as much as, you know, Canadians sometimes like to claim it as their own. And, and I look at, I, I think a team should be in Quebec city too. I'm not arguing one versus the other, but you know, you want the best athletes to play the sport. I mean, that, that, that's what secures the long-term future of the sport. And so it would be a big, it would be a big hole if, if, the NHL had to leave Arizona and, you know, this at least buys some time for them to try to, to find a better way to stay there. A uh, small clarification here. Question. You say that uh, Arizona, which city in Arizona has the fifth most, uh, is the fifth most populous in the state in, in the, think, in the, in the country, I should say. I think Phoenix. It, okay. Phoenix. Okay. Just cause you, you didn't mention the city specifically. So I just wanted but to get Tempe, that. Clarified. Tempe's right beside Phoenix. I mean, Tempe, if, if, if there was no sign, you wouldn't know you left if you know what i mean so it's it's part of the sort of greater phoenix area if you will okay all right so i learned uh, some geography today uh i want to get to the vancouver canucks and uh a hire that they made earlier this week uh cammy granado joining the canucks front office as another assistant general manager they already hired emily castone gay and now cammy granado joins the front office that's pretty that's pretty cool to see to uh, to see uh uh t- not just two women but two very qualified and prominent hockey women in one front office. What did you think of the hire? Well, you, you love to see it. I mean, Cammy Granado, you know, is married to my, my TSN teammate, Ray Farrow. They live in Vancouver. So like, it makes a lot of sense for their family. What a great opportunity for her and, and very deserving, you know, very decorated U S national women's team player was captain when they won the gold medal in Nagano. Um, you know, it was a scout with the Seattle Kraken and, you know, these, these opportunities, as I think we touched on when Emily Caston Gay was hired, are, are overdue to be given. You know, what occurred to me, though, is that because of there hasn't been upward mobility in this sport for women, um, you know, you don't have that many, you don't have that large of a, a pool of qualified candidates because, you know, women haven't been put into positions to, to, you know, get those sort of experiences. And I wonder if, now that organizations are starting to be more proactive in this regard, if there's almost a bit of a race now to, to hire, you know, it's, it's been a blind spot, frankly. I mean, only the Toronto Maple Leafs, if you look back like three years, you know, they hired Haley Wickenheiser, Danielle Goyette, they had a scout, Noel Needham. They were one of the few organizations until a couple of years ago that were like actively trying to put women in, in increased roles in their hockey operations department. Um, you know, it, it seems that the, the tide's shifting here a bit. And then the next thing I'm looking for is when is a female going to get a chance behind a bench or, or on a coaching staff, whether it's a video coach or, or some other type of role. I mean, that to me seems only, only, only a matter of time as well. And so I think that this could happen, you know, that, that we might see this happen more and more. And so good on the Canucks for, for being proactive, for 
I mean, just identifying two great candidates and giving them a chance. And, you know, I, I don't think this is the last we've heard of this. You know, I think that that other teams are going to take notice of this. And it just takes just takes a few men. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, what are we missing here? Um, and clearly, that's been a blind spot of, of NHL organizations. It's, it's just not finding a way to, to find the most qualified women and put them in these kind of roles. And, and you know, the Canucks are, are at the forefront now. I mean, it was only the second ever AGM was hired, you know, a few weeks ago in casting game. Now we already have the third, the fourth and the fifth and the sixth won't be too far in the future. Absolutely. Uh, and they have Rachel Dory too. Like the Vancouver Canucks are they're looking pretty lit. Uh, but yeah, I've like seen uh, other prominent women getting jobs as well. I think Blake Bolden was working with the, uh, the LA Kings as a scout as well. We last week, we were talking about Danielle Goyette, uh, because of uh, an issue with Newfoundland growlers of the ECHL having to be behind the bench there. I don't think you're, you're far off. I don't think we're far off from seeing uh, a woman do it at the AHL level and eventually at the NHL level. I, there are, I mean, Cameron Granato is a hall of famer and a Concordia stingers alone. I, I I'd like to see more of those players who have done so much for the game as a player eventually get to a point where we just kind of just casually see them behind the bench or just working with teams. Like imagine like Marie Philippe Poulin after her playing career is over, taking some prominent job in the Montreal Canadiens organization. But they can already do that with Daniel Sobejo too. But like, imagine that, like that would be just really cool to see. Well, and why not? Right. I mean, like Haley Wickenheiser is on the ice with the Leafs prospects. I mean, essentially what's amazing about her is she's still training to become a doctor. So she like works in the emergency room 24 hour shifts, but has, you know, also has her job at the Leafs, but you know, she's on the, the ice at development camp. You know, she was, she was Mary Fou- Philippe Poulain before Mary Philippe Poulain, like the best hockey player in the women's game. I mean, she's, she's got a lot to offer uh, still in, in those, in that regard. And so, you know, it appears that she, her career probably is going to take her, to medicine ultimately, but, you know, maybe someone would want to hire her as a coach. I mean, I, there's no shortage of, of options here. Uh, I think it's just a, about recognizing the opportunity and, you know, also there's a trickle down effect, right? You now have one team, the Canucks that have Rachel Dory and Emily Castingay and Cami Granado with positions of influence. They're in the meetings now when, when these kind of conversations are happening, they might have candidates in mind for jobs or future openings. Um, that that the other people that have worked for that team. I mean, I, I just think that the, the horizon broadens with the different perspectives. And so, you know, we've seen it in the other sports. I mean, there's a general manager in, in Major League Baseball who's a female. Uh, there's some managers, I believe, at AAA level that are female in, in baseball. You know, basketball's long been ahead of the curve. Becky Hammond, you know, was a coach for a long time in the NBA and assistant coach. And so it's it's coming. The, the question is always when, and, and but it just feels to me like, the rocks have shifted enough that it's going to it's going to happen pretty quick here. It's almost Valentine's Day and love is in the air. Whether it's a third date or a 30 year anniversary, you do not want erectile dysfunction getting in the way of a perfect night. If you've been experiencing ED, then visit GetRoman.com slash Johnston and speak with a U.S. licensed healthcare professional about ED. And if prescribed, you can get $15 off your first month of treatment. With ED treatments, you can have the self-assurance that comes from knowing you've prepared yourself for the moment, when the moment comes. Pick up your phone or laptop and complete a free online visit with a U.S. licensed healthcare professional. Roman offers five prescription treatments, including the brand and generic version of the most common ED medications. A U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. If prescription medication is appropriate, it ships to you with free two-day shipping. To make sure you get your package in time for Valentine's Day, your order needs to be placed by February 9th. So don't waste any time. Start an online visit today. With Roman, you get free ongoing care for erectile dysfunction, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. The whole process is straightforward, convenient, and discreet. It's simple. GetRoman.com slash Johnston, and then you can complete an online visit. GetRoman.com slash Johnston. Absolutely. Uh, Before we get to stick taps, I want to talk about a player we actually haven't spoken about in a while in uh, Jack Eichel. Uh, Remember all the sweepstakes with him and him going from Buffalo to Vegas and the artificial uh, disc surgery and well, he's been getting some time to practice and everyone's wondering, well, hey, when is he going to make his debut with the Vegas Golden Knights? Could it be next week? Could it be any other time? Do you have any insight on that? 
Well, they have to create cap room to activate them, right? And that's that's the question is how they're going to do that. You know, the Golden Knights haven't seemed too stressed about this, and they're they are a well-run cap team. Like they they've been dancing that the salary cap dance a lot. You know, actually last season they had to play short a number of games because of, of issues with with players getting injured, and you know they were over the cap, and there was no way to replace them until emergency conditions kicked in. But, you know, the sense there is that they, they're going to find a way to do this. You know, Mark Stone now is an injury. Maybe it's him going on long-term injured reserve because he's been dealing with a back issue. Uh, that's kind of nagged him through the season. You know, there's some other guys maybe they could look to trade. But, yeah, in terms of Jack Eichel, health-wise, it seems he's getting very close. I mean, he's, he's taking contact now in practice, which is essentially the last step before being cleared to play. You know, they got to see how he responds to that. You know, given the serious nature – of a, of a neck injury in his recovery, you know, they have to make sure that, that he feels good after taking hits. It's a very violent physical game, but you know, it seems like it's only a matter of time now before Eichel is playing. I think it'll be very soon before the end of the month. Uh, you'll see him make his golden Knights debut and, you know, it'd be a happy moment for him. I think this has been pretty personal. This has been a lot of tribulation to get to this point, obviously with not having a difference of opinion with the Buffalo doctors, having to wait through the summer and not get traded. You know, now he's, he's, so close to playing again and, and you know, he's going to get to join a team, you know, in time for, you know, potentially a, a long playoff run. So uh, I would think it'll come soon, but you know, the first thing we got to look for is whatever the significant roster move or moves are to allow him to be activated from long-term major reserve. CJ, are you ready for our Thursday segment of stick taps? I brought up the mini yeah. stick. You got to get yourself a mini stick, my man. You got to get yourself a mini stick. I'm sure you've played with mini sticks before, but you got to find one. You, oh yeah, you gotta do this in synergy. Eight eight year old CJ like would not watch an NHL game without a mini stick in his hand. Oh. Like actually, I literally had like a cabinet below the TV, and I would just be shooting a ball against it the whole time while watching a game. So I'm I'm familiar with mini sticks. I'm just not eight year old CJ anymore. We know, we know you're you're grown big money CJ. You're forty. We know, we know, we know. Uh, stick time. I wasn't gonna mention my age this time. Look at you outing me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not outing you for shit. You let everybody know that you're 40 years old. <laughs> I ain't <laughs> outing you for shit. That, that could be very, that's accessible information on the internet. Uh, my stick tap, uh, continue with the theme of coaching, goes to Claude Julien. Uh, it looked as if he wasn't going to be able to join uh, Team Canada's men's Olympic team because of a on-ice accident, which left him with fractured ribs. But lo and behold, earlier this week, he was in Beijing at practice and uh, will be reassuming head coaching duties uh, in time for Team Canada's next game at the Olympics uh, on the men's side, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I'll give him a stick tap for being able to make the trip to Beijing when it looked as if he wasn't going to be able to. Jeremy Colleton filled in admirably, was uh, coaching the team against Germany. They got the job, they got the job done there, but uh, Claude Julien, who has uh, won a gold medal with Canada before as an assistant coach, gets the opportunity to do it as a head coach of the men's team this time around. So I will give him a stick tap this week uh, for just being able to come back uh, to head, to coach this team. Nice. I'm going to go with two coaches uh, that I happen to get a chance to meet in Las Vegas. And that's Dante Abercrombie and Nathaniel Brooks. They were part of the NHLCA's BIPOC uh, mentorship program. They actually got the chance last summer to go to Arizona Coyotes development camp, and get the experience of being with an NHL team and coaching there. It's the subject of a new documentary that was actually sort of loosely uh, debuted at the All-Star Weekend, and, and which is why they were down there, called NHL Bound. It's now been more broadly distributed, and it's going to be a four-part series sort of documenting their, their journey. And so they were really cool guys. Uh, had a chance to, to, to tip back a drink or two with them. Actually, Dante said he's going to start listening to our podcast, so maybe you'll hear this. But you know, whether he does or not, I would encourage all of our listeners to go and check out that documentary because uh, you know, big things are happening for them, too. That is nice as well. And uh, yeah, I hope he listens to our podcast because uh, we have uh, some pretty cool episodes and, uh, of course, some more fun stuff to come. Uh, CJ, pleasure as always to do these episodes with you. Uh, we will be back on Monday with a brand new episode. Get your questions in for Ask CJ. You can tweet them at Reporter Chris with the hashtag Ask CJ. You can also uh, ask questions in our question uh, discussion channel on Discord. You can join Discord by going to sdpn.ca. You can click the Discord link to join there. Uh, check out CJ's work in the Toronto Star. Obviously, he is flying the flag 
for North Star Bets and subscribe to The Athletic. If you don't want to hear ads on the podcast, you can uh, listen to ad-free episodes on The Athletic. But you got to subscribe to The Athletic before you get those. For CJ, I'm Julian saying so long and peace. We will be back on Monday. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie.